I've heard these types of stories before. They always come from the same sorts of people, don't they? Skeptics. It could be because the people who believe don't feel the need to share their stories with just anyone. They are not as desperate for that validation. I wasn't a skeptic, though, and I want to talk. I thought avoiding a career in wildlife and forest protection was going to save me from having an encounter with anything weird. My grandmother used to warn me about the spirits in the forest. I never had a reason to tangle with them, so I kept out. I guess eventually we were bound to spread ourselves a little too thin. We pushed into too many of those once wooded areas. Maybe we invited the spirits out of their homes and into ours. That's where I saw it, after all, in my home. And what other reason would there be for a monster to walk through my back door? I work from home. Does that discredit me somehow? Maybe that's the reason you only hear these stories from people who have credentials. It does feel a little sketchy when I admit that I was sitting in front of my computer, staring at a blank text document, when the beast came knocking. I often lose track of time when I'm working. I do my errands during the day so I can afford to zone out and ride into the small hours of the evening. I don't know what time it was when I first heard the sound. It was a scratching at first, somewhat faint. It sounded similar to the squirrels I'd sometimes hear crossing the roof of my patio. It was a little longer, a little sharper, but it wasn't far enough out of the ordinary for me to take notice. The second sound was. That one I know I heard at 11.34 p.m. There was a single loud knock against the back of my house. My eyes immediately jumped to the clock. I was never the type to give visitors that late. And my friends weren't the type to bang on the siding of my home instead of on the front door. I talked myself out of investigating. It was easier for me to ignore it and to deal with the problem in the morning. Then it knocked again. One, two, three times in rapid succession. It sounded like a heavyweight boxer was trying to punch its way through my wall. I reached for my phone in case I needed to call someone. I made my way to the back door unlocked it, and stepped outside. My neighborhood had problems with raccoons and other small pests. I didn't know why, but I had quickly convinced myself that they were the culprits. They must have knocked a garbage can over or something, rolled it into the wall. I was right about one thing, at least. My garbage was toppled over. That was the only excuse I needed to believe my own lie. I focused on cleaning what I could, scraping the debris into the can, then grunting as I lifted it upright. I didn't hear the animal walk into my home. I didn't think twice about leaving that back door open. I always lock my doors now. When I returned to the doorway, looking in, it was right there, waiting for me. The monster looked back as if I was the one intruding on its home. It stood at least a foot taller than me. Its shoulders were wide and covered in mangy fur. A dog's head sat on its shoulders. My heart was hammering. The thing I was looking at, animal or spirit or whatever, wasn't supposed to exist. It certainly wasn't supposed to exist here. I froze. I couldn't pass through the doorway and I couldn't turn to run. As its eyes shivered in the dim light, I realized how doomed I really was. I realized how small I was. The security of my home wasn't going to protect me any more than a blanket over my eyes. I avoided the forest, sure, but the forest had come for me, or so I thought. When the beast sprinted at me, I blacked out. I remember hearing sharp toenails scraping the tile floor. I remember it closing in, then nothing. I woke up the next morning with the worst headache I had ever felt. I was still sprawled in the threshold of my back door. It must have slammed into me. My head must have hit the doorframe 
I wasn't harmed otherwise. I tried calling the police. When they learned that nothing was stolen, they seemed to lose interest. They suggested I call animal control. I did that too, you know. I wanted whatever help I could get. I described what I saw and the personnel either broke out into laughter or nudged me out of the room. The more I talked, the more crazy I was made to seem. Then I started to think about the stories, the ones that go like this, that come from the people whose jobs put them directly in the paths of these creatures. I got in contact with a few local park rangers. None of them wanted to speak to me. Strangely, one of them said that even if I'd seen something, then I knew as much as they did. Was that supposed to be reassuring? What was it supposed to mean? I felt like they were acknowledging something, at least. It felt like maybe I wasn't the first one to bring this to their doorstep, but it quickly became clear that they wanted their doorstep clear of any stories like mine. They acted like I was bringing the monster into their homes just by speaking the words in front of them. My grandmother is no longer with us. I can't ask her for the answers that I know she'd have. So, I've resorted to this. I told you what I've seen. Please, tell me what it means. I was called out to do a wellness check on an older woman staying in a cabin in northern Idaho. The call was made by her family. They said she went to the cabin to do some sort of research, but that she would check in with them daily, and she hadn't checked in. Her family didn't say what kind of research she was doing. They did tell me she was a bit eccentric. She had driven to Idaho all the way from Nebraska and had plans to stay out there for at least a month. She was traveling alone but always checked in with one of her daughters every day. I reached the cabin and her car was parked out front. I could see the lights on the cabin and the silhouette of someone sitting at a desk in what looked like the living room. I knocked on the door and no response. I knocked again and still nothing. She must have been able to hear me, but then again, she was old and could have had some hearing difficulties. I knocked on the door a third time, and again, no response. I turned the handle, and the door was open, so I announced myself and walked in. I was relieved to find the woman at the desk alive, but she was unwell. Physically, she looked fine, but I thought she was suffering from some psychotic episode. By the way she was muttering and repeating herself, I tried as best as I could to get her to talk to me, but she kept saying the same things over and over and over again. They're still alive. After all these years, they're still alive. I had no idea on earth what she was talking about, so I made the mistake of asking her. She pulled me over to her desk, where she had a bunch of maps of Canada and the western United States. There were these notes scribbled all over the maps and markers all across the west. She had an overlay of known cave systems and tried to explain to me that they live in the caves. I have no idea who they were, but I didn't think I would be able to make much sense of her ramblings. She sounded like she had gone completely bonkers. I tried explaining the reason for my visit, but she didn't seem to care. Now, I'm not one to get involved in people's personal drama, but she really seemed unwell. So, I called an ambulance. The EMTs practically had to drag her away from her work, but there wasn't much else we could do. I took a closer look at her workspace to try to get a clearer picture of what was going on. From the looks of it, she believed that there were cavemen or Neanderthal-type people living in remote mountain locations in both the US and Canada. It was totally insane. I called her daughter and let her know that her mom was okay, but seems to have suffered some type of mental break. I also told her about the cavemen 
That didn't surprise her. In fact, she told me that was the whole reason her mother was out there. She was a retired archaeologist and was searching for a race of mountain-dwelling cave people. Now I've heard a lot of strange things over the course of my career, but this one takes the cake. There wasn't an investigation to do here. The woman was receiving medical care. I had no reason to go through her things, other than to find out if she was well or not, but curiosity got the best of me. I took a few photos of her maps. One of the locations she had circled multiple times wasn't too far from here, so I decided to go take a look for myself. In hindsight, I should have brought someone with me, but how would I explain I was going off into the wilderness to look for a long lost species of ancient human? I must have hiked 25 miles that day and I didn't find a thing. I don't know what I expected. This woman was obviously crazy, but just as I was about to throw in the towel, I saw something in the dirt beneath my feet. It looked like a spear point. I don't think these are uncommon finds out here, and who knows what time period it could be from, or who made it. But it gave me a little encouragement to keep looking. The woman's map said there was a cave system nearby, but I couldn't see any signs of it. And then, just like I did with the spear point, I stepped right into it. Someone had gone to great lengths to hide the entrance to the cave. It went straight into a rock face, but there were trees directly in front of it, almost like they had been planted there. Hanging from the trees were vines and slabs of moss to disguise the opening. I moved the moss to the side. The smell permeating from the cave was foul. I used to work cleaning zoo enclosures when I was in high school and it rivaled even that. I could barely breathe without gagging. I peered inside and saw a faint glow from somewhere deeper within the cave. There were definitely people in here and I wasn't about to go in and disturb them. I slowly backed away and made a blind for myself on the opposite side of the valley. I was going to wait there until they came out. It wasn't until almost dark when one of them emerged from the cave and even in the dim light, I was quite certain it wasn't a Neanderthal. It was some sort of humanoid ape, maybe Bigfoot. I wasn't sure. It had hair all over its body, and it was hair. It wasn't a caveman wearing animal skins as clothes. It was difficult to see, but its face was more ape-like than human. It didn't have hair covering its face or its hands. I didn't get a good look at its feet. If I had to guess, I would say it stood about five and a half to six feet tall. It went on both two legs and four. I didn't get to watch it very long. I think it spotted me in the blind and went back inside the cave. I was afraid it was going to come back out with others, so I quickly got myself out of there. There was no way I could fight off a group of these things if they attacked me. They clearly had spears, and it looked like they had mastered fire as well. I didn't want to take any chances with something that intelligent. I never went looking for them again. I figured if they wanted contact with humans, they can come down from their mountains. But until then, I'm not going to look for them. The National Guard doesn't often get called upon to aid firefighters when things get particularly dangerous. However, we always answer the call. We might not be able to help beyond staffing road closure locations, but we do what we can. I reminded myself of that as we joined a team working to repress the Megafire in Oregon last year. I could help, so I would. I couldn't have imagined the trouble that I was getting into. I was stationed along the perimeter of the fire's projected burn radius. I had a vehicle to block the road the necessary signage to notify drivers, and another member of the National Guard 
to ensure that we look like we meant business. Unfortunately, that meant only one other human being would witness the same thing that I did that day, and no one would believe the two of us. When we first set up position on the road, the fire was still a while away. The plumes of smoke were visible overhead, but the heat and the glow wouldn't be upon us for a while. We tried to remain grateful. There were already men out there in the throes of the fire, risking their lives. We could handle a little traffic. Word got out quick that the road was closed. Civilians stopped coming our way well before the flames encroached on our location. We had time to kill. I don't remember seeing a single animal in all that time. I didn't hear a bird call or a squirrel hurrying by. We didn't think much of it then. Why would we? It seemed like the animals knew to clear out before we did, that's all. We were more worried about the people living near the area. If the fire continued to spread unchecked, there would be homes in danger. More homes, I guess. The heat and the smoke were already affecting some beyond our little road. Just when we started to feel the heat, we heard the roar. There was a long, pained bellow from somewhere deep inside the forest. In the direction of the fire, it sounded like something big was wounded. Both of us, I think, assumed it was a black bear. I'd never heard a bear sustain a cry quite that long, but these weren't exactly normal circumstances. If I was being chased out of my home by a giant cloud of smoke, I'd be screaming too. We kept listening. When the cry came again, and this time sounded a little more human, we took notice. It wasn't covered by our training, but we knew better than to ignore the hair standing up on our necks. We approached the side of the road and tried to look deeper into the woods. We didn't have much luck. We couldn't leave our post to look for the monster or the man that was making these sounds. So we just stood and stared. The cries were almost continuous and they were coming closer. Soon, they blended in with the whistling cries of the burning trees and the loud popping of the wood. The forest fire was playing a haunting song for the two of us. Then the man beside me pointed it out, the shape in the woods. It appeared from behind a gust of smoke. I could barely make it out at first. When the gray cloud cleared though, there was no mistaking it. It was the size of a man, a very large man I mean, and it was standing upright. Its fur was obviously thick, but I couldn't tell the color. It was packed with soot. A large patch on its side had been burned. I could see its blistered skin. The animal, whatever it was, looked like it was in pain. Its face, vaguely ape-like, was contorted into an expression of absolute fear. It didn't understand what was happening. It didn't know where to go. It was looking at us like we were the enemy, and maybe we were. I don't know the name for the creature I saw, but I doubted immediately that it ever had a friendly run-in with a human being. It was too intimidating. It was too strange. Just slightly beyond the realm of normal things that you see in the woods. I wished it wasn't hurting, but I wasn't taking another step towards it. Neither of us did. I think that might have been the wrong call. The beast ran away, and not in the right direction. It ran back toward the fire. We remained at our post. We didn't speak of the creature we saw that night. The next day, we gathered our wits and tried to report it, but no one wanted to hear about a monster in the woods. They let us write a report. They filed it away somewhere. The whole process was very rehearsed, very condescending. I don't know what they wanted me to think. I don't know if they wanted me to think I was crazy, or they didn't want to deal with the ramifications of whatever we encountered. I got the feeling that this wasn't the first member of the National Guard. 
who was told to keep something like this quiet. So I did. I tried to. My buddy didn't. And he couldn't stop talking. I haven't heard from him in a while. Haven't seen him. He stopped updating his social media. That got me thinking. There's going to be a day when I go quiet too. Isn't there? One way or another, we all get quiet eventually. This story I've got, I know it's weird. I know it's hard to believe. But maybe it's worth telling. Maybe someone else has seen the same creature that I did. Maybe it didn't perish in the fire. What do you think? Have you seen it? Have you heard of anyone else who did? Tell me, should I go back and look for the beast that we saw that day? Should I brave the woods, search the ashes, and get a real answer for once?